Welcome to Mission Gathering Charlotte. This community is for you. If you grew up in the church and have lost your faith, if you are in a moment of deconstruction or reconstruction, if scandals, politics, and hate have led you into doubt, if the stories of this faith raise doubts and curiosity in you, our time together is not about trying to fix you. You are not broken. Our journey in this life is not about erasing doubt but embracing them. For it is only on the darkest night we can see the stars. Life's journey is hard enough so we don't think you should have to make this journey alone. So if you are Asian, Latinx, Black or White, Indigenous, if you are male or female, trans or non-binary, if you are three days old, 30 years old or 103 years old, if you've never stepped foot in a church, or if you are Buddhist, Roman Catholic, agnostic or are a lifelong evangelical, if you are single, married, divorced, separated or partnered, if you are straight, gay, lesbian, asexual or bisexual, if you are a Republican, Democrat, independent, socialist or not registered to vote, if you have or had addictions, phobias, abortions or a criminal record, if you own your home, rent, live with your parents or are homeless, if you are fully abled, disabled or a person of differing abilities, you are welcome to join us on this journey to share our sacred meal at the Table of Grace, Happy Sunday, and welcome one and all. No conditions, you are loved. We cannot say no. You completely belong. No, we cannot say it enough. You are safe to be who you are. No, we cannot say it enough. So come to the table. There is a place for you. Come to the table. Come to the table. Just as you are. No exceptions. Welcome home. We cannot say it enough You're not on this road alone No, we cannot say it enough Nothing to prove you can let down your guard We cannot say it enough So come to the table there is a place for you, come to the table Come to the table, just as you are Come to the table, there is a place for you Come to the table, there is a place for you Come to the table, just as you are just as you are Just as you are There's no fear No fear in love There's no fear No fear in love You are saved to be who you are Nothing to prove You can let down your guard And come to the table There is a place for you Come to the table Come to the table Just as you are Come to the table, there is a place for you Come to the table, there is a place for you Come to the table, just as you are Just as you are Just as you are Just as you are 
just as you are. Hey everyone, Pastor Andrew here, and Happy Easter. If I'm the first one to say that to you, then I want you to hear it. I want you to feel it. Thank you for joining us this Easter Sunday online at Mission Gathering Christian Church, Disciples of Christ Charlotte. We are a community that wants you to join us, to come and be a part of things here in person. If you can't do that, we're, we're grateful for you joining us online. Easter is a celebration, and it's a celebration of what God has done and will do for us again. So may this time together, even digitally, even online, be one that fills you with the hope of Easter. If you find this service to be meaningful, if you find this time together to be one that you want to support, hit those cash apps or Venmos, or go to our website, to the give link. Help us keep this going. Because Easter is not contained within one Sunday. Easter Easter keeps coming, and the joy that we're feeling right now, we hope to carry all the way through the summer and into 2023. So thank you for joining us. Blessed are those who are weary. Blessed are those who are weak. Blessed are you when you sow. All you can do just to speak Blessed are those who are anxious Blessed the heart that's depressed Blessed are those who are stuck in a rut Someday they themselves will be refreshed all that we need Blessed are those who are hungry Blessed are those who have thirst Blessed are you when you've been made the fool for surely you've been through the worst Blessed are those with their back to Oh, uh-huh. 
Mother of the Earth who has given us all that we need. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look inside, he saw linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. He saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head, and it wasn't with the other clothes, but folded up in its own place. The other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place they were staying. Mary stood outside near the tomb crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them I am going up to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. She then told them what he'd said to her. John 20 verses 1 through 18, Common English Bible Translation the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So when I was reading this, this year's Easter gospel text, one of the things that stood out to me was Jesus using these words, don't hold on to me. I never really noticed them that much before. And maybe if you're reading from an older Bible translation, yours is going to say something like, don't touch me. But the Greek word here is hop to, which means to cling on to something. It doesn't really mean don't touch me. It means don't cling on to me. Don't cleave yourself to me. And I found this interesting because later in the Gospel of John, Jesus invites Thomas to touch his scars, to touch his hands and the wound in his side. But John's author like doesn't ever just write anything to be like just something that's there. Everything has a deeper meaning. There's a lesson to everything. This is the gospel for mystics, right? And the scene with Thomas was certainly a lesson that Jesus was trying to teach to both Thomas and the other disciples gathered there in the upper room. So I asked myself, what is Jesus trying to teach Mary here? And theologians in the past like caught up in their like terrible patriarchy and their horrible view about who women were, who women are, I've tried to say it was because Mary was a woman and, and Jesus didn't want to touch a woman. I think that's kind of silly. Jesus touches plenty of women, embraces them throughout the Gospels. Or others would say it was because she was a sex worker, but we know that's a lie. There was a Pope who made that up so that he could make it easier to, for people to know which Mary the Gospel was talking about. Because we've said before, there's like way too many Marys in the Gospel. It's like if you went into a 1990s kindergarten class and asked for Jessica, right? Everybody was named Mary, but that Pope had no evidence or no reason other than his own malice to throw that at Mary. And most of the early New Testament scholars in the early church call Mary the apostle to the apostles or the apostle of the apostles. 
So I don't think Jesus had a problem being hugged by sex workers or even hugged by Mary, who wasn't one. Mary Magdalene, apostle of the apostles, was probably one of Jesus' best students, one of his best friends. So I think something deeper is going on here with those words, don't hold on to me. You see, the risen Jesus that stands in front of Mary, he's not the same friend that Mary had stood by through his torture and execution. Yeah, this is that Mary that follows him all the way through. The one apostle that doesn't, doesn't abandon him. He's not the same teacher that she had shared life with, that she had been around campfires with, that she'd walked the roads of Judea and Galilee with. He's not been raised in the same way that her friend Mary of Bethany's brother Lazarus was raised. But Jesus has been raised into a new life, a transfigured life. One that holds so much hope and such possibility, yet still is a mystery to all of us in this life. Mary cannot cling to who he was, but is being invited into who and what he has become. Beyond God just made flesh. But Jesus, on this first Easter morning, is the beginning of a new and expanded incarnation of the Christ. The meaning of this incarnation is made clear by what Jesus says next, right? Don't hold on to me. Go to my brothers and my sisters and tell them I am going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. This is the first time, the very first time in the Gospel of John that Jesus refers to the divine as being their father and not just his. And this is the first time that Jesus addresses them as his siblings. The resurrection of Jesus has apparently created a kinship with the divine and all of God's children that has been marked out and made anew. We're now given glimpses into our deepest selves as being an expansion of the incarnation of God. As feminist theologian, Sandra Schneider elaborates on this meeting by paraphrasing Jesus' teaching to Mary Magdalene as this. It is no longer in and through my physical or earthly historical individuality that you can continue to relate to me. After all, I am still unascended to my father. Rather, go to the community, the new locus of my earthly presence. Jesus is not shunning Mary's embrace. Jesus welcomes her hug, but Jesus wants to give her more than that. Jesus honors her as the first to hear and to know about what comes next. He teaches her after Peter and the anonymous disciple of the Gospel of John have left. She is the first to hear the good news and to be told what it means that Christ is risen. Mary cannot be a part of what comes next if she clings on to who he was before. She must internally embrace what he has become by externally releasing him so that she can truly embrace what she is in turn to become herself. Mission Gathering and Friends on this Easter Sunday, some 2,022 years later, We are coming to the end of the season of Lent. And we are beginning the season of Easter. And I wonder, I wonder what it is as we come into this Easter season that we may be clinging onto, holding onto, death gripping too much. What are those things? What can we let go of? so that we can see the risen Christ? Where are ego and inflated nostalgia keeping us from seeing, seeing that risen Christ so clearly on this Easter? Like I said, Jesus does not tell Mary not to hold on to him to push her away. But Jesus tells her that because he's trying to help her move, to move towards something newer and bigger than she could have ever imagined. Think about this, that this Easter. 
as we move closer to one another again. It's been a long time. It's been a long time since we can go out and publicly embrace each other. For some of us, we weathered shutdowns and and pandemic with almost no physical touch. And as we return to the world, it can be easy. It can be easy to find ourselves trying to cling on to things or places or people or what was. And when we move into this time of Easter and we move into the world again, things may not be how we remembered them to be. Or maybe we just spent so much time away from each other that being a community, being that new locus, that new place where Jesus is to be found is, is really, really hard for us. I think the apostle Mary Magdalene has so much to teach us because she openly mourns what she lost at the crucifixion. Those two dudes that ran as fast as they could to the tomb. We don't hear about them being enough in touch with their emotions to actually try and process it, to feel it, to feel the weight. We know, I know that they were probably going through some stuff, but Mary teaches us to do it openly, to let it out, to process it. And the angels don't shame her for mourning. Jesus doesn't shame her for her tears. Why then? Why then should we cling on to something? Something from the past that keeps us from moving into the new because we have lost so much that we can never get back. So much time, so many people. And even though this is Easter Sunday, let us not neglect to mourn. If you have tears, let them flow. There's no shame in it. There's no shame in feeling all of the complex feelings that it is to be here yet again at Easter. After so much loss. And even as we still live in a world with continued loss and pain and grief. There's no shame in it. Name it. Mary names it. She knows why she's crying. But also, let us follow her example. Because after she is done crying and she sees the joy of the risen Lord before her, she does not continue to cling to him. She lets go. She lets go of the idea that everything will return to the way it was, that things will get back to being normal. And she embraced, she embraced what had begun on that first Easter Sunday, on that first Resurrection Sunday. She's gathering friends. We cannot return to normal after this pandemic because normal wasn't all that great. And it's never going to be the same as it was. You've changed. I've changed. The world has changed. Mission gathering friends, we can find, we can find what's already begun to form in the wake of all that change. The renewedness, the resurrectedness of life. Maybe that means finding new methods and means of intimacy and community. Maybe that means a new appreciation of time spent together and allowing that to be time well spent and not simply being busy or a list of tasks that need to be done, but really and truly being with one another. There's gonna be a lot of Easter sermons preached this morning about how this is our time to rebuild. But let us not move into our Easter season with the idea that we must rebuild things to the way that they were. But let us in the shedding of our honest tears and our honest rejoicing in the joy of the risen Christ, let's not rebuild but let's build something new together. Let's let go of the past. Stop clinging to whatever it is that is holding us back there. Those chains that we forged for ourselves that keep pulling us back. Let's let go. Let's be free of them. Let's be a part of the new resurrected life together, right here, right now. Life found in community a life found together because this 
this mission gathering. And friends, this is the way of Jesus Christ. Not a life spent in isolation, but a life spent in Christ together. Praise to Jesus, the firstborn into this new life that shows us the way. May we have the strength like Mary to follow it. She gathering friends, may it be so. Amen. This Easter, I would like to invite you to spend a moment in imaginative prayer with me. So getting settled into your seat comfortably, stretch a little bit if you need to. Work out some of that tension in your shoulders. Gently closing your eyes. Take two deep breaths with me. In and out. In and out. If you have thoughts that keep popping up, allow them to float by. Refocus on your breathing. In and out. In and out. In your imagination, you find yourself transported to a garden. You feel the warmth of sunshine on your face. There's a gentle breeze flowing past flows over you as it does. Birds are chirping and singing their songs. Before you stands a man, a person. This is Jesus as you have always imagined him. The one from days gone by. You run to embrace him. Entering into his arms, you hear the words, do not hold on to me. These words don't sound like judgment. They are gentle and tender. You hear them again. Do not hold on to me. You focus on these words. What is it from your past or your present that you are holding on to? What is it that you grip too tightly? What hurts, pains, and fears keep you holding on? What dead theologies and words have you tangled up? When those things come into your mind, take a deep breath. And hug yourself tightly. Arms around arms. Keep breathing. But tighten your hug as much as you can. Hear the words again. Do not hold on to me. Do not hold on to me. Do not hold on to me. As you are ready to release those things, allow them each to come into your mind. As you release each one, allow your hug to slacken. As you continue to release your grip, allow your hands now to fall into your lap with your palms facing up, ready to receive the new life Jesus is offering, ready to enter into the community, the new community. Tell him, say, 
Jesus, I am ready. Now take a moment to sit in the presence of the risen Christ. Allow Holy Spirit to speak her words to you. Thank God for this moment, for this new life, as you breathe in and out, in and out. Allow your heart space to be filled with love. Allow your mind to be filled with peace. that energy wells up within you, allow your body to receive rest and restoration. Just hold it there for as long as you need to. Be still, human one, and know. 